Welcome to the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved presentation entitled, Building an Asthma Care Home, Engaging Clinicians, Patients, and Caregivers in Comprehensive Asthma Management. My name is Corden Kane, and I'm the Coordinator of Program Evaluation at ACU. This training has been developed through a collaborative agreement with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Indoor Air Quality Division. Our speakers today are both from ACU, Lois Wessel and Anna Gard. Lois Wessel, RN, CFNP, is the Associate Director of Programs at ACU. In that position, Ms. Wessel has developed and delivered training modules for community-based clinics in the areas of asthma education, prevention of early childhood care, health literacy, medication management for patients of limited English proficiency, and use of medical interpreters. Additionally, she has produced low literacy diabetes material in English and Spanish. She is the ACU EPA Grant Project Co-Director for Comprehensive Asthma Care, Effective Strategies for Health Professionals, Sentiment, Environmental Trigger Management, and Underserved Populations. She is bilingual in English and Spanish and is a trained medical interpreter. Anna Gard, FNP, BC, is a family nurse practitioner and health disparities consultant for ACU. She serves in the National Health IT Collaborative for the Underserved Workforce Development Committee and is a HEMS member. She is a team clinician for the VNA Community Health Services Children's Clinic, a nurse managed health center, and a level two recognized patient centered medical home. Her key areas of focus are the intersection of health disparity, quality improvement performance, patient centered medical home, chronic care management, and health IT and safety net populations. And also, a small announcement tomorrow there will be a similar training in Spanish geared toward healthcare workers. If you'd like more information about the training, please email me at ccane, letter C, A, K, A, N, E, at clinician, C, L, I, N, I, C, I, A, N, S, dot org. And once again, it's a letter C, K, A, N, E, at clinician, C, L, I, N, I, C, I, A, N, S, dot org. All right, Lois and Anna, you may begin. Thank you, Corden. This is Anna Gard, and I want to welcome everybody to the webinar. Uh, thank you for taking some time to uh, join us in building an asthma care home. I first uh, would like to uh, list some disclosures about um, that we, both Lois and myself, have no commercial support for this presentation, and uh, there is no endorsement of the content by the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved, the Nurse Practitioner Healthcare Foundation, and ANCC, who are uh, doing the CEs, or uh, we will have no discussion of any off-label use of drugs or sponsoring agencies. This presentation has been funded by the US EPA, and we will discuss continuing education at the end of the presentation. We have no conflicts of interest in the materials presented. I'm sorry, my uh, screen is stuck. There we go. So, if you can't breathe, nothing else man matters. Where asthma is poorly managed, its adverse impact is felt community wide in increased health costs, lost days of school and work time, and most importantly, needless illness and death at times. We know the statistics are underreported because often uh, diagnosis is ranged from reactive airway disease to post-viral cough or shortness of breath, and clinicians are often hesitant to diagnose asthma if they think it's related to a viral sy syndrome uh, or patients don't want to hear that they have a chronic disease. Often improper ICD-9 codes may lead to underreporting. Uh, electric electronic health records may assist in improving asthma diagnosis and coding, uh, as well as with clinical decision support and computer physician order entry. In 2010, the CDC identified more than 29 million adults who have been diagnosed with asthma, 10 million children. Uh, so this means that there has been at least 1.9 million emergency department visits. And, um, and the, asthma, as, the average asthma hospitalization cost in the state of California is $16,600 per hospitalization. We do know that the rates of asthma are rising, not falling, and despite having uh, new evidence-based guidelines released in 2007, uh, we are seeing the incidence of asthma rising 
as well as morbidity and mortality related to asthma increasing. There are significant disparities with asthma, as you can see uh, listed in the bubbles on the slide. Children have higher rates of asthma prevalence than adults, and the asthma prevalence is highest in Puerto Ricans, followed by Blacks, Native Americans, and Native Alaskans. There is a lower incidence in Caucasians, even less in Asians, and the lowest incidence is in Mexicans. Those with family income below the federal poverty line have higher, higher current asthma prevalence than those above the poverty level. Persons living in poverty, we know, are more likely to use the emergency department for care, lack a primary care provider, and often live in substandard housing that places them at substantial risk of ongoing exposure to asthma triggers. In a recent study, a sample of homeless children in New York City the prevalence of asthma in those children is 39.8%, which is more than six times the national rate for children. Uh, and we do know that asthma in homeless children is likely to be severe and substantially undertreated. I'd like to uh, proceed with telling you a story about a fictional patient, Rosita. But she is Similar to many of the patients that we see, particularly those of us who work in safety net communities, Rosita and her family face many of the disparities leading to poor asthma outcomes. They're temporarily staying with relatives in an old apartment where the landlord has done minimal upkeep. Her mom struggles to pay for food, clothing, help with rent, and buy Rosita's medication. In the apartment that they are sharing with cousins, they have relatives who smoke, and there's a significant mold and cockroach uh, infestation. They also have uh, several stray cats that they have adopted who come in and out of the apartment. Before getting enrolled in a local CHIP program, Rosita was seen for asthma type symptoms at an urgent care clinic, a uh, target based clinic, and in an emergency department. Each time her mother was given prescriptions, which she couldn't fill because of the cost. The urgent clinic gave her a nebulizer treatment. The target clinic gave her a prescription for inhalers, and the emergency department gave her a nebulizer treatment, a steroid injection, and she was told to follow up with her primary care provider. But she had no primary care provider, and it took six months for her mother to get her enrolled and get her an appointment. Her mother, Gloria, never understood that Rosita had asthma. Rosita was diagnosed with reactive airway disease, but no one ever discussed asthma as a chronic disease or what triggers asthma. Rosita's mom is one of 55 million people who speak a language other than English at home. And although language services are mandated by law and by quality cert certification standards, her mother, Gloria, was never offered a trained interpreter. There are approximately um, 36 percent of adult Americans who have a level of health literacy below what is required to understand typical medication information uh, based on a 2003 survey of the National Assessment of Adult Health Literacy. Fourteen percent of American adults function at below basic level, which means they can't perform basic tasks, which require reading, they have trouble completing forms, they have limited ability to provide history, and can't read appointment slips or pretest information, uh, which creates general limitations in self-management. So uh, despite the fact that Rosita was seen by multiple uh, health care providers in multiple environments, because of the challenges of uh, English not being her mother's primary language and low health literacy, she did not understand how her daughter's disease or how to care for her daughter's disease. There were many barriers faced by Rosita's family. Uh, limited control over their living environment because they stayed with cousins who were renting an apartment. Uh, there were cultural and linguistic realities, low literacy and low health literacy, significant poverty, and housing with increased triggers. We know, specifically related to asthma, uh, that asthma dis disproportionately affects people in low-income housing. Many at-risk families are uh, disproportionately concentrated in poor quality housing, and 90% of the time we spend indoors, particularly more if living in unsafe neighborhoods. 
the affordable housing crisis where the gap between household income and housing costs for many Americans means that even working families can't find decent housing. Minimum wage jobs don't provide enough income for a household to afford to rent a two-bedroom home. And according to a study by the National Low Income Housing Coalition called Out of Reach 2012, in no state can a minimum wage worker afford a two-bedroom unit at the fair market rent, working a standard 40-hour work week. The, uh, there was uh, an older study of 2007 that uh, stated um, that in order to afford a uh, healthy housing apartment rent, you needed to earn at least $30 per hour, and this was in 2003. So healthy housing for many of our patients is beyond reach. Just this June, uh, there was a federal action plan released by uh, a joint federal effort that um, Health and Human Services, EPA, and um, HUD, I, and they identified four key target areas to address uh, disparities in asthma care. Lack of access, physical and psychosocial and environmental factors, lack of local capacity to deliver community-based integrated comprehensive asthma care, and gaps in capacity to identify and reach most children. We are trying to focus on coordination and collaboration by presenting uh, comprehensive asthma care in the patient-centered medical home model. Uh, we are trying to help leverage existing resources and program capabilities by encouraging partnership with community resources in your area. Uh, we hope to share with you uh, the integrated uh, NHLBI 2007 guidelines to uh, remind clinicians about the evidence-based practice for comprehensive asthma care. And we would like to demonstrate that use of health information technology, particularly meaningful use of electronic health records, can support evidence-based uh, clinical decision support tools to improve asthma care, as well as increase patient management and patient engagement with tools like the personal health record, uh, use of a patient portal, and also familiarizing yourself with some of the mobile health technologies that are currently being developed, such as Text for Health, which is a mobile technology uh, that allows for prompting your patients via text phone when it's time to come in for their flu shot or for their planned asthma visit. There are other technologies such as Asthmopolis, which was recently cleared by the FDA as a mobile device, which is placed on a rescue inhaler, and then with each use, a message is sent to the cell phone. Uh, in this case, it's a smartphone app uh, of the time and place of the inhaler use. The patient then has a record of their location, their time and place, so that when uh, you sit down and uh, assess a patient's asthma control, they can share this data and you have a more accurate means to assess control of asthma symptoms. Asthma care in the patient-centered medical home um, really helps us focus on using the patient-centered medical home model to integrate chronic disease management care. Using the patient-centered medical home provides an opportunity to integrate the 2007 asthma guidelines by emphasizing increased access for our patients, care management and care coordination, and improvement in quality performance measures. By becoming a patient-centered medical home, practices can improve safety, efficiency, and quality of their chronic disease management and in many states, position their practice to take advantage of private and public incentive payments that reward patient-centered medical homes. For example, I currently practice in Pennsylvania, and our Nurse Managed Health Center, which um, recently actually just got recognized as now a level three patient-centered medical home, is part of the Pe Pennsylvania Chronic Care Initiative for Asthma. So we've integrated our chronic asthma care management in the patient-centered medical home model and have quality metrics which we follow to uh, demonstrate improvement in our asthma care.
again, using evidence-based practice, uh, we, as we have looked at recent um, studies and CDC statistics, we see an increase in asthma incidence, but we are not seeing improvement in morbidity or mortality. Some of the possible explanations are that clinicians are not using the most recent evidence-based guidelines or not identifying asthma and making a diagnosis, uh, or our families are not recognizing the symptoms of asthma, or we have less families who have uh, less access to health care. The NHLBI uh, guidelines, which came out in 2007, emphasized four areas to focus on in terms of evidence-based practice. One is control of environmental factors and triggers that contribute to asthma symptoms. Two is focusing on educating the child, the family, and other caregivers and using written asthma action plans to help with daily management, uh, making sure that uh, clinicians are assessing asthma impairment and risk and then categorizing asthma severity, and emphasizing pharmacologic therapy, including long-term inhaled anti-inflammatory medications for persistent asthma. Despite these guidelines being re released in 2007, uh, research studies show that they are not being followed, so that uh, there was a release of an implementation panel report with six guidelines to help support implementation of these guidelines, and they are listed in these bubbles, and we will continue to go through the rest of this uh, program uh, showing how to support implementation of these guidelines based on the implementation panel report. The priority messages for this is to make sure that uh, we assess asthma severity. Research shows that when clinicians document asthma severity, there is a greater correlation with use of controller medication. Um, and making sure that we really focus on allergen and irritant exposure control. So in assessing asthma severity, you need to look at Impairment and risk. Impairment focuses on the frequency and intensity of symptoms and the functional limitations for activities of daily living. Uh, that would be, for example, cough due to asthma, wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, nighttime awakening. Risk is looking at what is the likelihood of exacerbation, and that is determined by um, looking at how many times they've been to the emergency room in the last six months, whether they've had a hospitalization due to asthma or whether they need to be on oral steroids. The screenshot shows here an electronic health record asthma clinical decision support form we are currently working on developing with the Alliance of Chicago, which is a health center controlled network. We are uh, piloting this form to integrate into Centricity GE um, electronic health record, which will help clinicians as they go through their assessment to document uh, severity and control and help with decision support. The next recommendation is to assess and monitor for asthma control. Control is the degree to which asthma symptoms are minimalized, minimized by therapeutic interventions and that the goals of therapy are met. In general, we think of the rules of two. Um, are you using your short-acting beta agonist or a rescue medication more than twice a week? Are you waking up more than two times per month with coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, or shortness of breath? Or are you refilling your rescue inhaler more than two times per year? If they are doing anything more than twice, that means that their asthma is not controlled. There is a standardized five question tool, which has been clinically valid, validated and recognized by the National Institute of Health called the Asthma Control Test. This screenshot shows a copy of this test in Spanish for the age of 4 to 11. The, this tool, the Asthma Control Test, is available online. It is also listed on the ACU Asthma Resource List, and it is available in English and Spanish and can be given to the patient or parent to complete prior to the office visit while in the waiting room, and if needing assistance, the uh, 
staff person, whether it's your medical assistant or nurse who rooms the patient, can go through this objective checklist to come up with a score which determines level of control for asthma. This is a screenshot of our um, clinical decision support form, which once severity and control is determined, it will help then to decide whether uh, what step medication should be prescribed uh, as listed in the stepwise chart uh, seen below. Inhaled corticosteroids are the most effective long-term control medication for persistent asthma, yet consistently are not being prescribed for our persistent asthmatics. Oftentimes, this is related to not only the cost of inhaled corticosteroids, which often range anywhere from $95 to $135 uh, per month supply, but because patients don't understand the purpose of controlled medication. They often have a limited ability to distinguish their medications and the label. I once had an adolescent patient who told me that she uses the pink inhaler because she likes the color pink. However, the pink inhaler was not even hers, it was her friend's inhaler. So it is important as clinicians when prescribing medications is to make sure that our patients understand which medications to use and when. And a real focus on health literacy is important during this counseling and um, education piece. It's important to ask the question, tell me which medication do you use every day? And how can I help you remember to use your medication? Try to simplify your instructions. Dose all your inhalers at the same time per day. It is recommended that for inhalers, we use spacers, but often they're not covered by insurance and can be expensive. And for many of our patients, we may suggest using a one liter uh, water bottle uh, in lieu of a spacer um, to help with the proper administration. Asthma action plans are an important part of the asthma guidelines. All people with asthma should receive written asthma action plan to guide self-management efforts. There should be prompts in your workflow for any of your patients who have an asthma diagnosis to make sure that they have an asthma action plan. And this asthma action plan can be a tool that is shared across all providers, across uh, with the schools, with camps, with daycare providers, with aunts, uncles, grandmothers, so that uh, all family members can be aware of self-management guidelines for asthma. This provides a very user-friendly tool for the patient and family to feel as if they have some sort of control over their asthma management. What's listed here is an easily uh, accessible asthma action plan. The red stoplight um, use is um, a familiar symbol. It's sort of a universal symbol. Green means they are doing well. This is how they uh, when their asthma is under control, this is how they manage their asthma. Yellow gives them some guidelines as to when they get in trouble, what they need to do, and the red zone tells them what they need to do, and usually it says um, if there's trouble breathing, administer your, uh, uh, your rescue inhaler and call 911. You can uh, have the asthma action plan embedded in your electronic health record which then enables that to be a part of the patient's record as well as easily can be shared uh, with specialists and other providers. Planned visits. Planned visits are the best way to assess control because you can't assess control during asthma exacerbation. And it's important to uh, have your patients come in to see how well their asthma is controlled. Many offices, um, approach this in different ways. Some offices have a week in October that they call all their asthma patients in for planned visits and they dedicate that week at the health center as their asthma week. They usually pick October because then they can give all of their asthma patients their flu shots and then they may do another planned asthma week in the spring to, provide, to prepare uh, their asthma patients for spring allergies as well as complete any camp forms uh, or uh, after school forms or school uh, related sports forms for the spring. 
but planned visits are a part of the patient-centered medical home model. And um, when you think about a planned visit, you think about how does your healthcare team uh, approach this. Oftentimes you have an asthma educator or a uh, nurse who is in charge of your asthma patients uh, who can then risk stratify uh, your patients. So any of your high risk, uh, severe um, or persistent asthmatics are identified and they are the ones who may get extra asthma education. Uh, they may be called in uh, and invited to group visits or may be invited to have home visitation uh, to support their asthma management and care. Group asthma visits are um, often an effective way to reach your asthma patients. Uh, oftentimes people uh, feel supported when they're in community with other families who experience asthma in their, uh, with their loved ones. Uh, they can often be led by a community health worker or a nurse or an asthma educator, and they can, uh, you can charge for these uh, visits. Uh, and there are multiple vi uh, billing codes available for group visits. Asthma home visits can be very effective, and there's multiple programs, uh, community uh, programs, uh, some sponsored by HUD, like HUD Healthy Homes, in which community health workers are trained to do asthma home visits and will often uh, use uh, an asthma checklist, like the EPA home checklist, to help uh, walk through the home with the patient and families to look at environmental triggers that may be um, worsening a, a child or an adult's asthma. Um, as I said, this is listed on our, the ACU asthma resource list. It is uh, a free downloadable checklist from the EPA. We're going to spend the next few moments uh, going over specific environmental triggers with practical, realistic recommendations for uh, trigger control. And I am going to hand the baton over to my colleague, Lois, who is going to speak specifically to environmental triggers and control. Right, and while you're doing that, Anna, I'm just going to jump in and, and mention a few things. Um, we do have a chat button in the bottom right. Some of you have actually asked a few questions. So if you hit that um, bubble on where um, in your upper right-hand corner, you can type in under to the Q&A group, and we will address your questions uh, later in the presentation. A couple of people have also asked about the resource list that Anna mentioned. All of the uh, resources that Anna mentioned in the clinical guidelines um, and the Federal Disparities Action Plan are, and the, some of the low literacy patient education materials are available on our resource list on the ACU website. And so you'll be getting some more information about that via email later on or before you get your email, you can look at that list. And one of the things that we ask of you is that um, acquiring and finding low literacy patient information is a moving target. And so if you have any uh, documents that you use or we're specifically interested in non-written materials to reach our patients with limited English proficiency and low health literacy. So videos, some of these interactive apps that Anna mentioned. If you have resources that you found that you think should be included on our website, we um, welcome your suggestions and we can include those with our resource list. So I wanted to talk about asthma trigger control in the home. And if you think back to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute guidelines that Anna mentioned, there are four main points. And one of them is um, providing the correct medication and the use of the steroid inhaler. And the other is assessment and monitoring, monitoring how asthma is doing. And Anna addressed those with some of the tools that she mentioned. But the last two talk about patient education and building partnerships with families and patients with asthma. And as clinicians, we learn a lot about providing the correct medication and diagnosing a problem, but we don't often learn enough about how to provide patient education in a culturally and linguistically co competent way that addresses some of the barriers that low-income families have to reduction of indoor asthma triggers in the home. And there are numerous studies that have been done, and they're listed on our website, that talk about uh, trigger control in the home and interventions where community health workers and nurses went into the home and simply helped with getting rid of mold and mildew and ways to eradicate um, pests such as cockroaches and, and um, rodents in the home. So we're going to talk 
a little bit about some of the things that can be done for trigger assessment um, that we can talk to our patients about to reach those goals of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute guidelines and asthma. And one of them is simply asking about where does the child seem to have or the adult have more problems when they're outside, when they're in a room, when they're petting their dog. Um, and one of the things that's key to that is to be able to document that you've done, one, questioning about tr trigger control, and two, education about it. So this, again, is a, another screenshot of a tool that we're working on to integrate this into an electronic health record so that clinicians or part of the clinical team, may it be the community health worker or the medical assistant, could um, begin to ask about some of these things and provide education. Perhaps in one visit we'll talk about tobacco smoke and, um, and animals. In the next visit we would talk about um, mold and, and flowers and it can be documented so as the clinician you can know what's been addressed. At, um, at each visit. And in terms of the specific triggers that we like to go through with patients, we also like to talk about trigger control, again, in a way that, that addresses the barriers that they may face in their life. So one example is um, it's been proven that having dust mite covers on the bed and on the pillowcases is very effective. But also, often people don't know where to buy them or how much they cost. One of the things that we've really looked at is how clinics and clinicians can build partnerships with institutions in their community, with the local Target or Walmart or CVS, and come up with some kind of deal. If we're sending our patients to you to get their asthma medications filled, could you, for every medication that's filled, give them 10% off or give them a coupon for a free um, pillow cover and ways to, to bring the, uh, the community businesses um, into the community by helping them uh, come up with some of the tools that people need. So that's something that involves getting out of the, uh, of the exam room and thinking what's in the community. The other thing that you, we look at in a lot of patient education materials, it talks about washing, washing bedding frequently in hot water, in fact, water that's over, I think, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And we know if you're low income and you're washing your things at a, um, in a laundromat, you probably don't care about the temperature because you're not going to walk another six blocks to the next laundromat. Um, so frequent washing is better than saying um, no washing or, or washing in a certain water that's a certain uh, degree. The other thing to think about is um, limiting the number of fluffy objects. What I tell my patients is dust mites, they may be tiny, they may be microscopic, we don't see them. They're there in millions in my house and in your house. They like fluffy things just like we do. So the more pillows you have, the more blankets you have, the more stuffed animals you have, the more dust mites you're going to have. Um, and so I'm um, asking them to limit the number of fluffy animals as well as um, getting stuffed animals that are washable um, is key, as well as washing their window carpet, their windows, their rugs, um, and anything in their home that's washable could and should be washed. When we talk about pets, such as rodents and cockroaches, we have to look at this, again, in the housing situation that many people live in. The problem may be bigger than just their apartment. Um, one of the things that we are trying to focus on now is uh, population data, and that ties into some of the things that Anna was talking about in terms of documenting how severe the asthma is and coding that appropriately, because with that, we can then pull up the data and see if there are many people in the same zip code, in the same apartment building, who have the same problems, and then address it from the perspective of creating a clean and healthy home um, and coordinating with many of our, our colleagues in the Healthy Homes movement to make sure that we have safe and healthy housing for children and families who have asthma. So it's important to ask about um, where they've seen uh, cockroaches and pests and then find out what is feasible for them to do. Certainly there are simple things like throwing out bottles and cans before placing them in recycling bills, not keeping stacks of paper, um, washing and drying dishes immediately after use, um, wiping down areas under the sink, cleaning surfaces, cleaning crumbs, cleaning up spilled liquids, putting food away and not leaving it out, um, putting food in the garbage, taking your garbage out, Frequently, and when we talk about the cultural context, it's really important to ask, where do you eat? Who eats? How do you eat? Um, one of the, the things that I found in my clinical practice, working primarily with a Latino population, is that often the men leave very early for work in the morning, 
and um, the women stay home, prepare the big family meal, and they go off for work before the dad comes home for work, and they leave the meal out on the table. And I had a patient who once told me that leaving the food, putting the food away, her husband would feel like she didn't love him very much, and in fact, she had to have the food sitting for him on the table. And we were able to explain to him, you know, your food is also the mice's food and the cockroach's food, and you don't want that. We're leaving a buffet for them. If she puts the food away, it really means she cares more for you because she doesn't want those pests getting into your food. Um, and it wasn't until we explained it in that context that we were able to um, work with them to put the food away. Another thing which we could do a whole webinar about is integrated pest management. And that ties into some of the other things we've talked about, and that basically focuses on using the least toxic amount of material in the smallest portion of the house. So if, if Johnny comes home after school and eats cookies on the couch and the dog hops up on the couch and then um, uh, Mary, the sister, sleeps on that couch because she doesn't have a bed to sleep on, there may be many um, pests in that area. But if we keep Johnny eating in the kitchen and keep everything in the kitchen, then the pests are just going to be in the kitchen. And if we do have to use some kind of um, pesticide, we can use it in one area of the house. One of the other things that often happens is that people use overkill, and they use enough of a spray or a poison, not just to kill the pests, but in fact to uh, cause harm to, to pregnant women and children that may be in their home. And if you remember that you know, children, just by giving their small body mass, a little amount of a toxic uh, substance may be much more detrimental to them than it would be to an adult. So integrated pest management looks at this, the safest option, the least amount of toxic uh, materials, and sometimes things that where as a poison roach could go eat a little bit of, the, of a toxic poison, go back to the nest and die, and there it's other people in the roach family or other roaches and eat that roach, and they get some of the pesticides. One of the things that we find is that many people who have low health literacy also um, are using materials that uh, they don't know how to use or using them um, not in the right way. So taking a spray kind of raid and just spraying it all over the house uh, may be problematic instead of spraying exactly where you've seen the pests. And um, I have patients who buy in a local bodega or a little Hispanic corner store, um, a product that's made in China that's called um, roach chalk, and they write all over places where they've seen the roaches, but it's quite toxic where there may be more beneficial things, such as boric acid, which is a very, 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 very low toxicity to humans, but it's quite toxic to roaches. So really integrating um, the ideas of integrated pest management into clinical practice um, is key to making sure we're killing the pest effectively but not uh, killing off our patients. Um, the next one I want to talk briefly about is mold. And, and uh, I think one of the things that's very hard about mold is we often don't see it, and patients may be embarrassed to say they do see it and they have mold in their house. But some of the simple things they can do are washing the shower curtain when they wash the clothes, throwing out shower curtains. They are available at the dollar store, so replacing a shower curtain every couple of months is a low-income solution. Um, washing the bath mats and anything else that may have mold, uh, wiping the sinks down um, so that mold doesn't accumulate, leaving lights on in closets and basements because uh, lights do retard mold growth, um, using fans and using air conditioning where appropriate. Um, we also know that a lot of um, folks with limited resources to pay for heating in the winter vent their dryers into the house to get the warmth, and that brings moisture into the home as well as also the dust from the dryer. So finding out about heating and how they're heating their home and how they're cooling their home. And again, if they say, well, the landlord doesn't want to turn on the air conditioning until the 4th of July, we've had some days that are over 100, and I live in the Washington, D.C. area. In May, we had days that were over 100. So that, that may be a landlord-tenant issue, which again needs to be looked at um, in that perspective. And earlier I talked about the stuffed animals may be a problem because of dust mites, and I always feel a little bit like Scrooge when I say that the rubber ducky in the bathtub may also be a problem because um, rubber duckies and anything that's closed may uh, accumulate water and moisture and heat in there and mold may grow. So having bath toys that are more like the kinds of things like yogurt tubs and things that you can spill and clean off very easily um, can help um, reduce mold. Uh, we asked our mold specialist at the EPA 
what should we tell when we do these webinars about what product is best for mold because it used to always come up. And we were told that the best product is actually elbow grease, um, that just scrubbing mold where you're seeing it with a brush, a stiff brush, is just as well as any kind of products that are out there. And again, many of these products have scents in them that also may be problematic for people with asthma and allergies. In terms of pet dander, um, uh, we've all heard from patients who say, oh, I have a non-allergenic cat or a non-allergenic dog, when in fact the only kind of pet that is really non-allergenic is a reptile or fish, something without fur and, and, and fl flakes of uh, saliva and, and flakes of urine that dry on the body and fall off. Um, and so it's very hard for families if they do have a pet and a family member is allergic to a pet. But certainly um, vacuuming frequently is important. Asking about where the child spends time. There may be a bunny rabbit or gerbils or hamsters in the classroom. And so if, if that is the case, that this needs to be addressed with the teacher. Um, pat dander is very sticky and it's one of the substances that can be brought home on clothes. And in fact, if they're in an apartment where previously a cat was living, there may be dander left over, which again is another uh, example of it needing to be looked at from the point of view of um, of a safe home for, for patients. And doing a health history, it's important to ask about um, things other than cats and dogs, gerbils, hamsters, rabbit, birds, um, guinea pigs. Um, and then reminding patients that uh, minimally the pet can't sleep with the child who has asthma and in the same place. The bedding where the animal sleeps needs to be washed when the family's clothes needs to be, are washed on a frequent basis. As much as possible, the pet needs to be kept outside. And often it does mean finding a new pet um, for the um, for the family. I'm sorry, finding a new home for the for the pet, which is very hard for many families. The pet is an integral part of the family, um, and so that may be very traumatic. And we can very easily say that that's what needs to be done for the child's health. But we need to think about it in the context of how difficult that is for families and support them in making the decision to give away the pet. Um, somebody uh, did pose a question about what do you do if a family doesn't have a vacuum, which is a very good question. And having things that don't need to be vacuumed is key. Uh, floors that can be swept and the, the dust can be swept outside and then mopping down a floor is better than having a rug. Having window treatments that can be washed and dried in a dryer um, as opposed to sometimes people wash, uh, I'm sorry, vacuum their blinds. Um, uh, it's really washing and, and getting rid of the dust by sweeping and wiping down with water, similar um, to how people are taught to deal with, um, with chipping paint in their home if they're worried about, about lead. And ultimately, we would like families to have a vacuum cleaner, and buying a HEPA vacuum cleaner may be very expensive. Um, I want to uh, talk briefly about tobacco smoke, because everything else I've mentioned, probably we all have had in our house, whether or not we have done it, we have, as clean as our houses may be, we all have dust mites, we've all seen mold. Even if we don't have a pet, somebody stopped by with a dog in tow or we've brought home cat, hand, cat dander on our clothes. But tobacco smoke is not something we all have in our home. And many of us have policies in many of the schools and the communities where we live in and the restaurants have smoke-free policies. And in some ways, this is one of the hardest to deal with because tobacco is one of the most serious addictions out there. Um, I've also seen providers shy away from talking about smoking because especially if you're a pediatric provider, you say, oh, that's an adult problem and I don't want to deal with it, even though we know in addition to asthma, the risks of, of cancer from um, inhaling secondhand smoke and, and SIDS and other problems are, um, are very serious. Um, according to the Allergy and Asthma Network Mothers of Asthmatics, most children with asthma who are treated in the emergency department live with a family member who smokes. Um, and we used to talk about secondhand smoke, which was just breathing in the smoke, and now there's something that's being discussed, which is thirdhand smoke, and that is simply bringing home the, the smoking, the, the smoke on your clothes. And so um, I have patients say, oh, well, he, the dad doesn't smoke around the child. He goes outside to smoke a cigarette. He's bringing home some of that tar and nicotine in his clothes and then, you know, holding the baby or being with the child. Um, and so we really need to look at ways uh, to address that. We know that smokers below the poverty level are less likely to succeed, um, but we know that there's, um, there are good tools out there, um, patches, nicotine gum, um, acupuncture, um, oral medications that can be taken. Um, and, so, and we also know that addressing smoking is part of meaningful use in an electronic health record, and so we are looking more, more at how to do that. Um, 
we again, this is another thing that we could spend our whole time talking about, but instead of hearing me talk about it, I do invite you um, to visit this section of our website where we have many resources specifically about um, providing smoking cessation to um, underserved communities who may have some of the issues that we've brought up, such as low literacy, low health literacy, um, limited access to prescription medicines, because there are many tools there that talk about how to um, address smoking cessation um, with your clients. Um, and lastly, I wanted to mention that we talked about the, the main triggers that come from a fabulous document called Clearing the Air, where the Institute of Medicine um, did a, a thorough investigation of what were some of the prime triggers in the home. Um, but they also mentioned that there were other triggers that are also important that we forget to ask about because they're not as common as talking about uh, pet dander and smoking and mold. Um, and they may be different for each client. So finding out what are the spiritual and cultural practices in the home, are they Buddhist and do they light incense? Do they, do they um, participate in some kind of santeria, which is a, a Caribbean, Hispanic, uh, indigenous um, uh, philosophy where they use a lot of votive candles and candles with scents? Do they use those actual plug-in air fresheners that um, through a little bit of electricity, a low level of um, some kind of supposedly great scent is released into the air, but in fact those may actually be an asthma trigger. Perfumes, nail polishes, are there hobbies? Um, does somebody in the family like to build those little model airplanes and use paint? Does somebody in the house, um, an artist, and like to use painters? Um, does somebody in the house use a lot of hair products, uh, sprays and different gels? Um, how is the house heated? Um, there, are, there are many different things that may come up, and somebody has typed in a question, which is, wow, isn't this overwhelming? Where do I begin? And we don't mean to overwhelm you, but what we do want to do is say that there are many triggers out there that may be forgotten, and they can't all be handled at one visit. And so I'd say where to begin, there's two ways to begin. And one is to look at um, the questions you ask when somebody comes in. And in one visit, maybe talk just about mold. And in another visit, just talk about the hobbies in the house. Um, and if we can, at every visit, add one or more trigger to the visit, by the end of a year, we will discuss these triggers. And if you remember, there may be many children in the house who have asthma. So if you talk about the triggers with mom when you're seeing Giovanni, and then when you see Mariella, you talk about a different trigger, the mom will be getting the same education that she can spread out. Um, and that EPA checklist um, really runs through the triggers and talks about solutions that is on our resource list and is available from um, the EPA. And then I think the other that is really important, um, as Anna touched on, is a planned care visit. We see way too many children um, who have just come from an emergency department or with an acute exacerbation of asthma, and hopefully we can turn them around and not send them to the emergency department. But we don't see them enough for an asthma healthy visit, where both the child and the parents um, are receptive to education because they can breathe. They're not back to that first slide. If you can't breathe, nothing else matters. If you can't breathe, and I talked to you about mold, you don't want to hear it, you want to be able to breathe. So bringing our patients in for asthma education sessions for the annual flu shot day and providing some of this education in groups um, is key, as well as, um, and this ties into where we're going next, is um, chewing up some low literacy patient education materials um, in the waiting room or if you have an electronic health record in the exam room in that 15 or 20 or unfortunately 30 minutes of somebody may be waiting for the provider. If we can integrate our medical assistants and our nurses to say, wow, this is a kid who's been seen three times for asthma, let me run the asthma video in, in French since they're from West Africa or in Spanish because they're from El Salvador, then when the clinician comes in, some of that education can be followed up and the patient will have heard information. Um, and so those are a couple places to start out to begin. Um, and, and I'm just going to um, end up, and so we have a little bit of time for questions, to talk about um, written materials. And this slide is intentionally violating the basic rules of how you do a PowerPoint, which is not too many words. And I think the rules of how you do a PowerPoint with a lot of white space and letters that are readable are very similar to how we need to provide patient education. And, and I won't read this for you. I'll just you know show you that. The words like aerosol and suspension and metering valve and canister are words my patients don't understand. And the math problem on there to how to figure out if your MDI or your inhaler has more left in it is way too complicated for most of the patients that I see. 
So we really advocate looking at the materials you have in your waiting room, looking at the materials that you're giving out, and trying to find simpler things which are available. I'm talking about asthma in a storybook, um, some materials that are in the target language, um, uh, some non-written materials. The upper left is, is something that was a, a doll that somebody made where they could provide patient education using a doll, um, using theater groups. Um, to come in and, um, and providing education in a way that may not be written, that may be more oral, um, and that may be more um, interactive. And I think we'll see a whole new world out there with, um, with uh, information that is available in a downloadable format or available on smartphones. And in the community health center where I work, we've recently developed a partnership with the local pediatric hospital and all kids who are asthmatics, um, if they have access to an email, which more and more of my patients do, they will be emailed a link to low literacy patient education videos um, in a target language, available in French, Spanish, and English, to talk to them about how to use an inhaler, what medicine to use when. Um, and we can look for more ways that, that texting, as Anna mentioned, and videos, and again, um, apps and other things um, can be uh, a way to engage patients who may not be learning best by, by English, I'm sorry, by, by written materials. Um, and um, one of the questions that has come up is, how do you get people to come in for these planned visits? And I think one of the things that's really effective is you make a day of it. And no, you don't do it on a Tuesday where the mom has to go to work and the dad has to go to school, but you do it on a Saturday and saying, we're having an asthma fair, and you invite that CVS or that Target that I mentioned that we want to partner with to get the, the mattress proof, proof um, the mattress covers at a low cost, and you say, we're having an asthma fair, and we're going to talk about inhalers, and we're going to talk about um, uh, ways to uh, reduce your time that you need to spend in an emergency department, and then you, you make it a, a happy event. And um, uh, Anna has heard me say, I have some clowns staying with me from Guatemala who are here for the uh, International AIDS Conference, and they use clowning as a way to do health education. So what are some of the creative ways? Can you do a role play, a skit about asthma? Just free flu, free flu shots for the whole family on our Asthma Health Education Day um, and really integrate learning about health as a fun thing to get people to come in as opposed to, oh, my God, I've got to go in for a shot and they're going to get mad at me because I'm using the wrong inhaler. So I think that's one of the ways um, that we can really bring patients into um, the clinic setting. And it may not be at a clinic setting. Uh, I, we're doing a similar presentation to this tomorrow in Spanish with some health promoters who do their work in the schools and they do their they do asthma fairs in the school and the asthma educators are there at the PTA meetings and at the school carnival um, and talking about many of the things that we've talked about today in a context outside of the clinic because that's often a better way um, to engage people. And then lastly, I've touched on building um, community partnerships um, with the local retailer, with the school nurse. Um, pharmacists do fabulous patient education, and they know when you're refilling the um, albuterol inhaler and when you're filling it too frequently and you're not filling your steroid inhaler. Um, so making friends and understanding the pharmacists in the community are key. And I've touched on um, working with um, legal partnerships and community health partners. Um, and I want to, we've been kind of answering questions as we go along, but I want to make sure um, that um, you all know that um, you can definitely email us, and I'll, I'll pop this slide back up in a second. And we do have many resources available um, on our website. And um, as Anna mentioned, we also really support having that asthma control test, which we brought up earlier. And again, it's, it's on our resource list, and it's in um, English and Spanish. For somebody, when they come in, even if they don't come in for an asthma visit, and then we can be doing an assessment of how their asthma is doing, and that's something that we can certainly document and then ask them to return for an asthma visit. Um, but I, I didn't want to let you guys go before addressing the fact that um, some of you may have signed up for continuing education, uh, continuing medical education through the American Academy of Family Practice, and you will be getting something specifically about that in an email. Um, and some of you are getting continuing education through the a nurse practitioner healthcare foundation, and they are an accredited provider of nursing education um, from the American Nurses Credentialing Center. And um, you will also be getting some follow-up emails about that um, in the next uh, day or so. 
Um, so in the meantime, I, I think we've been addressing the questions as they've been popping up. Um, but um, and I did want to announce that a recorded version of this will be available on our website, so you can uh, share it with your friends at a later date and, and go back to it. But if anybody has any questions now, uh, we do invite you to, to type them uh, in so that we can address your questions in the uh, one minute or so we have until we finish up. And is there anything that you wanted to mention that I forgot? No, I think uh, Lois, you do such a great job with the environmental triggers. Um, as part of the uh, Asthma Chronic Care Initiative in our clinic, uh, as I mentioned, we actually uh, give the asthma control test to uh, our patients with every visit if they have a diagnosis of asthma. Again, that goes back to making sure that we assess and diagnose and document and code our patients uh, as well as we um, document their severity of asthma. But with every visit, they do an asthma control test, which really gives us an objective number whether or not their asthma is controlled. It's a five-question test. As I said, it's very simple. It takes just a matter of seconds to do. We document it in the chart, their score. And if they are not controlled, we, we do assess it during that visit, even if they're in for a rash or an ear infection. Uh, but then we also plan a follow-up visit if we make any kind of medication changes or we change their asthma action plan uh, to make sure that they then are under control. Um, so it really is a matter of sort of touching our patients uh, with every time we see them and uh, addressing. Um, it's sort of like having a diabetic patient that if they come in for a blood pressure check, you still ask them what their blood sugars are and how well they're controlling their diabetes, and it should be the same for asthma. We have um, two more questions, um, which are, thank you, Anna. What are your thoughts about hu humidifiers and vaporizers? And I think that's a great question. And one of the things that often happens is we have one kid who's got an upper respiratory infection, and we say, oh, use a humidifier, and their brother has asthma, and we say, oh, don't use a humidifier, and we're saying the same message to the same, to the same parent. Um, I think it really depends on, on the family, but certainly putting more moisture in the home does create more dust mites and more and more mold. Cool mist vaporizers are better, um, and using them, again, just in one area of the house um, tends to be better. And just because we have a child with asthma, the asthma may be well controlled, and then they have a, a virus, and they have a stuffy nose, and they can't breathe. And certainly, at that point, you know, using a vaporizer to help them breathe more easily at night um, is probably a good thing. But leaving a vaporizer um, running constantly is probably um, not the most effective thing. Um, and somebody else asked, should environmental triggers be assessed at all clinical visits as well as triage visits? Um, I would say ideally yes, but in reality we often don't have time for that. And that's why having documentation of talking about triggers um, throughout the different visits that somebody has. So you do it, um, you know, as I tell my patients in Spanish, poco a poco, you know, bit by bit. So you talk about two triggers in one visit and two triggers in the next visit. And throughout the year, you've kind of educated them, uh, but often there's not time to, to talk about um, triggers in every visit. But if they know what their triggers are, and you've documented that their trigger is a is a is pets, one of their triggers is pets, and then you say, well, has he been around a place where there's animals? Well, yes, he goes to his grandmother's house after school because I can't afford a babysitter, and the grandmother has a cat. Then we know what the problem is. Um, so you you kind of have to see what the flow is like in your own clinical setting, but they should be addressed as frequently as possible and, and readdressed to see if somebody's been exposed um, to those triggers. Um, and um, somebody asked about the, what measures do you use or recommend for evaluating the quality of your asthma program? And I think, again, that's a good question, and, and um, I want to answer that one. Um, you know, I think as an organization, um, you know, you could certainly look at you know, the national um, uh, quality measures. Uh, we, and you can also look at data in terms of um, how, how many of your patients who have persistent asthma are on um, inhaled corticosteroid inhalers. Uh, you can look at how many of your patients with asthma have been hospitalized in the last six months? How many of your patients have 
um, been in the emergency room for asthma, you can start looking at uh, are you following up your patients who have been in the emergency department <coughs> for asthma, how quickly are they seen and assessed, <coughs> and are they being brought in for planned visits to assess control? <coughs> Excuse me, what percentage of your patients have asthma action plans on file? So looking at these guidelines, looking at the implementation panel report <coughs> and recommendations, then as an organization, you can look at what quality measures do you want to choose uh, and then start collecting that data and looking over a six-month period of time um, or a 12-month period of time. Um, so it's really, it's, it's variable. And then, you, you know, you want to compare it to, like, meaningful use measures. So, for example, if you've implemented an electronic health record, part of meaningful use is you have a clinical decision support tool. Are you using it? So if you decide to use a clinical decision support tool for asthma. Um, so there are ways of looking at different measures and tying them in um, to meeting other guidelines as well. Um, and we have time for like one or two more questions that I have up here. Um, uh, somebody suggests the assessment of peak follow up visits. Is this practical in a primary uh, care um, setting? I guess the question is. Do um, you want to address that, Anna? Yeah, you know, there, there has been some um, mixed uh, opinion about the. Um, effectiveness of peak flow measures, um, and you know, particularly in a pediatric population. So I know in our own practice as part of the chronic care initiative, it was decided not to use peak flow measures as um, a way to assess control, that we use the asthma control test instead. Um, so, you know, it really sort of depends. Um, I think peak flows have somewhat fallen out of favor, and I also, when you're talking about a safety net community, depending on where you are, if you're working on a mobile van or in a shelter, um, you may not have a peak flow, uh, or certainly your patients may not have access to peak flow meters to do at home, and uh, you may not have it in your exam room as well. Uh, should asthma action plans be reviewed and updated at each clinical visit? Um, uh, usually uh, not because you don't just by virtue of time, but uh, we certainly for our uh, planned visits. So we, as part of the planned visit, we review the asthma action plan, and ideally we like to have those planned visits uh, at a minimum of twice a year. Certainly, um, if that doesn't happen, that at any uh, annual physical exam, the asthma action plan should be reviewed and updated. And um, you know, you usually pick like sort of high target times. So when uh, when your families come in and they need sports form completed or they need their school physical form completed, that's an ideal time to review the asthma action plan and make sure it's updated, and then provide a copy to go to the athletic department or the school nurse or the um, the camp nurse uh, or the daycare provider because they need forms anyway. So that's a good time to do the asthma action plan. I think that that's key. We often give them a copy of the asthma action plan, but the school nurse or grandma who takes care of the kid or the camp nurse or the the coach doesn't get a copy. So really providing multiple copies of the asthma action plan. And something that's a challenge for my um, patients often is um, throwing out the old plan because, uh, you know, old copies are, are, are floating around. So making sure you put a date on it and, and trying to encourage them to have grandma throw out the old plan because this is the updated one. Uh, and there's a question about spirometry for true and accurate diagnosis of asthma based on the guidelines. Um, to determine uh, control uh, and risk and impairment, it's recommended to do annual spirometry. Again, it really depends on the setting that you're in and uh, whether you, as a healthcare provider uh, in a safety net setting, have access to spirometry. If you don't, it is not completely necessary in order to uh, categorize impairment and risk. Uh, it certainly is a helpful tool, but uh, if you don't have access to spirometry, it is not a necessary component. 
Um, and there was a question earlier on, is there a standardized follow-up flow sheet or action plan that is used for monitoring control? And some of the samples of, of some of these plans are available um, on, our, on our resource page. So I think we have a picture one, if I can pull it back up, um, that Anna mentioned earlier. Yeah, it's under the severity, um, because the electronic form, the severity and control assessment are the same. Um, next one, uh, next one. Go back, uh, yes. So if, no, that. So if you look at that, um, under, if you're assessing impairment, um, there, is a, there is a place to look at um, spirometry. However, you can make a determination of severity without assessing spirometry if you don't have access to spirometry. Um, and looking at impairment and risk, the factors that you look at for impairment and risk to determine severity are the same that you look at to uh, determine control. But this is a copy of, uh, as I said, a form we've developed for an electronic health record. Uh, other electronic health records have asthma forms. Uh, they may not have been customized to the guidelines like this has been, but we've worked very closely with an informatist at Alliance of Chicago uh, to develop this based on the guidelines. Um, great. Well, we um, thank you all for being here and sharing your lunchtime with us because we know as clinicians it's often hard to get away from patient care. Um, and I will just quickly put up uh, the slide that has our contact information if you didn't get it. And you will be hearing from us regarding uh, your continuing education credits. And again, we are doing this session or similar session tomorrow of in Spanish uh, with an actual Hispanic healthcare promoter. And if you have any um, promotores in your clinic, we invite um, them to participate. And you can contact our colleague, Horton Kane, C-Kane, C-K-A-N-E, at clinicians.org to, um, to register from that. And again, we encourage you to send us any low literacy materials or any other materials that you may have that you think that would be um, of value to this. Somebody recommends doc. Monaghan's Kits for Patient Education in English and Spanish written at a sixth grade level. And I do not know of that, so um, I will write that down and we will, all, uh, we will definitely check it out. Um, so thanks again, and a recorded copy of this presentation will be available on our website in the next couple of weeks, so, so do check back. Oh, sorry, let me ask our website, www.clinicians.org which is up here on this slide. Um, so there's our email and our website. Thank you very much.